Okay, so everyone's ready? Cool. Let's start. So, first of all, introduction and who I am. Uh, two most important things you need to know about me. First of all, I'm from a company called Invica, which basically gives me opportunity to do all the crazy stuff I'm doing. Another important thing to know about me is that just five years ago, I was normal, usual, happy developer that were just writing PHP code all over the place and happy about myself. But somewhere around four years ago, I got this very nasty disease, chronic disease, which is called test first disorder. Basically, it prevents me from writing code without writing first, tests for it first. Who knows about this, about this disease? Yeah, nasty stuff, guys, be careful. So, Basically, since then, since starting to, like, to understand the quality, the inner quality of the products, the inner quality of the code, I started to appreciate and like, search or seek for new information around there. And I got into this like, new level of TDD, which is called BDD. And basically, through this, through multiple years of thinking and uh, developing myself, I got into this area of business analysis or agile business analysis and value. So basically, I'm a classical developer that just started to appreciate business or value in what I'm doing. And uh, since then, I, I did a lot of things like I introduced or created frame, PHP frameworks for BDD, like BHAT, Mink, PHP Spec, Prophecy, and so on. I contributed to major frameworks. And the last thing that I'm doing recently is I'm, me and my friend from Belgium started Elephant in the Room. PHP podcast about design. So this is all about me, but I think the topic of the, of the talk is the value and what it can do for you and why it is important for the project. And I think the first thing that is important to understand is what is our job? Anyone has ideas? What is our job in this industry? Anyone? Throw our guesses. Sorry? All kinds, All kinds of stuff. Okay, meet the business needs and client needs. Yeah, that's, that's is a good one. I have more, I guess, specific and narrow point of view. Uh, I think our job is to change the world. And it's just like, oh my god, this, another crazy guy speaking on stage. Through software and delivery, right? A little bit more grounded. But I think it is really, really important bit that we lost during the, all the presence of IT industry and all the growing of in IT industry is just that our actual job is to change the world or make it better. And I think what we lost is the understanding of how, how big of a power we have in order to do that. So if we look at like, how products were created before the web or before we were doing stuff in, in the web, it was something like this. You need to find a good idea. You need to design the product around this good idea. Then you need to find an investment. Then you need to sp spend millions of on pr proving this design working. Then you need to release the product. Then you will, find, you will definitely find a bug in the product or the problem. So you will need to retrieve product back because of the defect. And then you need f f to find another investment to fix the bug and release another bunch of the product. Then you need to refine the product, release it again, and hope that you'll get both investments back. right? This is the classical way of re releasing product. I'm exaggerating here, but it was close to this. But then web came, and things changed. Right? How do we release products right now? Well, basically, it's something like find a good idea, code it, deploy it. Again, I'm exaggerating, but the thing you need to understand is how much simpler it became to deliver something to the millions. Right? You don't need to buy a factory in China to produce something. You and your friends can code something over the, or, over the evening and deliver it to millions and solve problems. But with all this immense and crazy power that we have over the web, over the lives of people, how do we use those powers? How, how, how do we use all this? We create features. We create features everywhere. Every single website, every single project we're starting, we're not thinking about 
the power that we have and what we can do with it and how we can empower the world. Instead, we're just, we got so focused on the features, we got so focused on delivering some abstract functionalities that we forgot what is the main part there. And we got so carried away with those features that we even started to treat methodologies or the practices that should help us to move projects forward as a way to, to improve our features delivery processes. So for example, this is like the classical delivery process where you have like pipeline of features you want to, improve, to, to deliver, but then Agile came and we're like, hey, we don't need to commit to specific set of features because every time we can change what features we're delivering. And then we, again, we can change. And it's just like after half a year of changes, you deliver something like Google Buzz that nobody wants or needs, and then you close it. And if you think that Google Buzz or other projects that released and nobody needed is the biggest problem of this industry or is just like limited to Google, you're wrong. Because Standish Group, this is an organization that for a de decade was committed to capture, gather, and analyze information about the software projects, about functionalities and features, and how people use them. And the stats are really crazy. For stats says that 45% of all the delivered features for every project are never used. 45%. And then you have like some of the features, 90% are rarely used, some of them used sometimes, some of them often. And only 7% of the features that you deliver through the websites are used by your customers constantly. Only 7%. 7% of your work actually finds a finds a customer, which leads to really sober and like crazy conclusion that we actually as an industry taught ourselves and committed to deliver waste, right? And that's very, very sad truth and the very sad thing to understand. And I think if you can get one thing out of this speech today is stop delivering features, start delivering value. Right? Features is something that, sh that should help you to deliver value to the people. Features is not the goal. Features is, is merely a way to deliver some, function some, some value to this world, to change someone's life, to touch someone's life. But that's not the goal itself. So stop delivering features, start delivering value. Yes, but how? How can you deliver value in the industry that's so focused on the features? We hear this all the time, like clients come to us and say, I want this scope, I want this set of features. And uh, it is really, really hard to switch to delivering value instead. I know that because over the last couple of years, that's what I was trying to do over the course of multiple jobs. And the truth is, it's just like there is really simple recipe to do that. And the recipe is deliver as much value as possible by delivering as less features as needed, right? The goal is to eliminate amount or limit amount of features you deliver, but all those features should have some value to the end customer or to the product or to your client. And in order to do this, you need to keep focus, right? You need to keep focus on the value. You need to consider every single feature in the project according to the value. And you need to constantly evaluate what are you doing with your project. And this is basically where agile behavior analysis comes. It's like it's transition of classical business analysis to agile business analysis where instead of just trying to understand the entire business, we're just trying to understand the impact we're trying to bring to, to the world or to the project or to the customer. And there is like really easy predefined set of questionnaires or rules you need to follow in order to keep this focus on the value and help your project actually deliver the value rather than set of abstract functionalities. And in order to do this, you need to, to go through a set of five steps. First, you need to understand what is the goal or the minimal valuable product that you want to deliver, right? What is it you're trying to achieve with this project? Where is, uh, what is this direction you're trying to go? What is it you're trying to change in this world or in this business? And this will form your minimal valuable product, not the set of features, not the scope, direction, and 
goal in achieving the value. Second question is what is the minimal set of features to support? So minimal valuable product plus the business goal which, with which it's connected is a good thing, but we also need to understand what features we want to deliver and how they are connected with this goal. So we basically need to recreate or start recreating the backlogs or scopes of the project according to the value, not the other way around. And then we need to answer three last questions is which features are more likely to bring this value? So we need to choose, again, remember, we can't deliver 100% of the features because we know that only seven of them will be useful or mostly useful for, for people. So we need to prioritize drastically. And also we need to understand that we don't need to implement all of the features or all of the functionality on the project 100%. We just need to s a small fraction of the features in order to achieve or deliver this value to our clients. So the last question is how to avoid gold plating because that's the last thing we want to do if we're trying to deliver value. We don't want to be carried away with all the crazy code architectures and stuff that basically doesn't deliver anything rather than uh, future proving something that we haven't brought to the world yet. So basically we don't want to to architecture the complex systems when the initial basic idea of the goal haven't been pro proven. And uh, I have the answer to this in form of BDD pipeline. So BDD pipeline is a set of processes around BDD that helps answer those five questions. So it is predefined practices that help you drive out the business goal for the project or direction for the project and every single feature on the project and also make sure that delivery happens according to your goal. Basically this is a crazy process which built around the idea that if you can connect every single line of code you're writing in the project or every single configuration file you're changing in the project to the value it delivers, this is where you can stop delivering waste to this world. So this is a practice that we developed over the last year in Vika and we use with a lot of customers and the projects, commercial ones. Uh, the thing about this one, you need to take it with a pinch of salt. It does work for most of our projects. For some of them it doesn't uh, because of the legacy patterns and because of the customers' uh, preferences. So practices are useful and they deliver value to the project and they help you to focus on the value but you need to be aware that there are other tools and practices around there that you can mix and match. So this is a, a, a coherent process that you can use from start to the beginning, from the beginning to the end, but you don't need to. You can just take parts of it and mix with your own practices. So let's start. What is the goal in minimal valuable product? Right? The first thing you need to answer when you're starting any project, any software project, and the way BDD Pipeline answers this is the impact mapping. Impact mapping is a practice created by Goiko Adzik, one of the major pillars of BDD community, basically. So he created this tool that helps you to, planning tool that helps you to set strategic focus or strategic scope for the project, to understand what, what are you trying to achieve with the project, where are you trying to get with the project, and see all the different alternative passes because, let's face it, there are some, human mind is like, it's constructed in the way where we always see only one pa pass through from the beginning to the end, but there is multiple, multiple alternative ways. And you can have multiple different people on the project that have different ways of understanding that. So, impact mapping have four different questions or levels of the questions. And it's basically mind mapping technique where you just like layer information on top of that. The first question is, why are we doing all this, right? What are we trying to achieve with this project? Second question is who will be impacted by this project, right? Who are the actors or different stakeholders in this project? Then how can they help us to achieve the goal? You see that the, cent the approach switches its center from focusing on the features to focusing on helping some behaviors to uncover. So instead of just focusing on like functionality to the website, we're focusing on how can we support someone's behavior in the world? And then only the last question is, what can we do to support them? This is the beginning point of the feature, right? So first understand what you're trying to achieve in the long term or what is your goal of the project. Then, then who can help you with it? 
then how he can help you with that? What he can do or what will he do about the project? And then, only then, what you can do in order to support this behavior. So the classical impact map looks something like this. So this is like social game or online casino, for example. So you have a business goal of reaching one million players in one year, for example. Right? This is a short-term strategic goal. Reach one million players. It is a concrete, it has a focus on it, so you know where you're going. And then you have a set of actors around that. There is a players who will play, there is advertisers, and there is internal stuff. So for example, how can players can help us reach one million players? Well, they can help us to invite by inviting friends, right? Players inviting other their friends will bring more players online. How, what can we do in order to help them invite friends? Well, we can introduce semi-automatic invites. We can introduce incentives on the project. We can introduce personalization, right? It's this personalization feature that you always add on the website, now you suddenly know why. Because you want to bring more people in. And this is how you uncover your minimal valuable product, right? This is like minimal set of minimal marketable features that you can choose to deliver the product. You don't need to do all of them because only part of them, only a small fraction of them will actually deliver the value and will actually be worth it to, deliver, to be delivered. So this is impact mapping. This is how you uncover this minimal valuable product on the highest possible level. You can read more about impact mapping on impactmapping.org. There is a short brochure kind of book that you can read. Really useful practice. So now, as we uncovered all those minimal marketable features, as we say, so all those high-level features like product search, now we need to go deeper and to understand what are user stories or what are features we need to deliver because like product search is too big, right? It's like it's an epic in agile world. There is so much you can do there and there is as little you actually need to do there. So feature mapping is a backlog grooming technique. It is a graphical process, same as impact mapping, mind mapping technique, which helps you to drive out your product backlog out of the impact map. And there is like only three levels in comparison with, feature, with impact map, which has four. First, what you need to understand is what is the minimal marketable feature you're trying to deliver. So you're taking minimal marketable features out of the impact map. So your product searches or uh, semi-automatic invites, you put them in the center and then you start asking questions. Who will be interested in this feature, right? You are, again, you're trying to understand who will be impacted by this feature. So now you're going a little bit backwards. And then what particular parts of this feature do they need to create the impact, right? So you're going opposite way, but you're trying to understand how much of the feature you need to deliver. You found out all those complex features. Now you need to understand how much of this is actually needed. And classical, like, feature map looks something like this. You have a product search, and then you have two, two actors, visitor and customer. And the cool part about it is we don't think about our products in this way nowadays, and that's, that's a problem. Because we treat all of, the peop all of the customers on our products as a generalized customer or generalized visitor, but they are different. Like, if you treat two different set of customers on the product as two different set of customers, you can define features or deliver separate features to them and you can focus on specific user group rather than focusing on all of them at the same time. So in this particular case, if we're talking about the e-commerce website and the product search there, you at least have two separate set of users or customers. You have visitors, so those guys, they don't know what they want to buy. Right? They, they just go to the website, they know that this website is about cosmetics or about, I don't know, like toys, and they want to find something around there. They want, to, they want you to convince them about the products. Those are the guys for whom you're building product search, facet search, uh, pagination, filtering, sorting, all of this kind of advanced stuff. And then there is a customer. This guy comes to the website and he knows exactly what he wants. He knows that he wants to buy this specific product. And for this guy, what you need is a search field on the home page. And then for this guy getting to the product search page, it's already a uh, kind of drawback, right? Because this guy just wants to buy. He knows what he wants to buy. For this guy, the journey is enter the product name on the search field on the home page, get to the product page, buy it. 
That's it. By splitting those things separately, you can make drastical business decisions about the product. You can say, this particular product, we know that like 70% of our customer base know exactly what they're buying. So let's create the like best in class product search field on the homepage. And we don't need search page with pagination, with facets, with all of this stuff. Because we don't need it. Because the customers we're aiming to are completely different. So you take this information like feature, from feature map, you take impact map, and you create the backlog. Well, visual backlog anyways. So it will look something like this. This is basically combined impact map plus feature map. So you have your goal in the center from the impact map, decrease maintenance cost but preserve conversion rate. Then you have set of actors about impact map, then some of the actors like customer can buy more products that thus preserve in conversion rate. And then you have like product search which, which goes to the feature map, like customer, visitor, as I described before. And the cool part about it, if you look at the like specific notes here, this is your user story, right? This is your agile user story, best in class, way of describing your backlog. You have connection with your business goal, you have your actor that you're trying to bring benefit to, everything is there. So this is a very, very fantastic way to create a backlogs out of nothing. Basically, out after successfully finishing impact map and feature map, in our company we are capable of creating backlogs, 120 user stories backlogs in a matter of one hour because it's just copy-pasting from the map to the backlog. But that's not enough, because identifying all those like features, this is a huge amount of stuff we, we can deliver. And only a small fraction of it, again, we need to deliver. Remember, only 40% of all this will be actually used. So we need to find a way to prioritize this. And let's take a look again at this. So this feature, this user story, in order to maintain my shopping history as a site visitor, I need to be able to register on this site. It already has all the information we need in order to make uh, complete and, and like f very good prioritization decision, right? We can prioritize. In order to prioritize, you just need to do something like this. You, you, you get your backlog, you sort it by the role and benefit that it is important for you at this stage of the project, you take 25 stories out of this. This is your sprint backlog, right? Very simple. You don't need to go into the complex uh, prioritization stages where you're just like trying to co constantly communicate with the guy. No, value plus beneficiary for this value. What is more important for you? And we had like project recently where a uh, client had problem of choosing what features are important for him. And uh, basically we had once one and a half sprint of work, but we, have, we had five sprints of backlog, right? And client had problems choosing what is there. Went there for half of day, draw back the connection with the business value, basically refined the impact map and feature map, and he dropped 70% of the backlog in half of day, easily. Because that's what clients actually care about. Not about your scope or their scope, not about the budget. What they care about is about delivering value how much they can earn by delivering this product. And you need to convince them that they, can, they need to actually deliver a small set of features. So now, understanding like what we actually need to deliver is not enough also, because we need, to we need to make sure that we're not delivering more than it's enough. Because even those small features like auto completion on the homepage, it could be it, depending on the client or depending on the business need, it could be very simple or it could be very complex algorithm behind that. You need to understand what it is. And here comes like the classical rule of Agile. So in Agile, every user story has, every single user story has those three things. Business rule or business rules you're trying to deliver to the project. Promise to have a communication about story. And then you need to have acceptance criteria, so you need to commit to something in this before going into sprint. And also you could have like prioritizations, estimations, but that's not essential. Those three things are. And the mistake that most agile teams are usually doing at the beginning of the project, they say, okay, we have business rule, we have acceptance criteria. Let's say business rule is acceptance criteria. Let's commit as a team to the business rule. The problem with business rules is they're too vague, 
right? You could, business rules are forced Enforced, complex, enforced complexity on the project. Business rule could be as simple as email validation, which is simple for everyone who works with like predefined CMSs or that can Google for this algorithm to validate emails. But just imagine if in this world there is no validation out there for email and you need to write it from scratch. It is a complex piece of work. The truth is you need, don't need the entire validation. You don't need to validate all the possible permutations of the email. You just need to understand who are your users and what kind of emails they need to use. And then you need to choose. So basically, it is bad to commute to the business rules because they could have enormous amount of hidden complexity in them. And there is one missing bit, which is like communication. If you're committing to the business rules, there is no incentive to have communication. And communication is one of the most important bits, the key pillars in the agile world. And how do you com conduct this communication? How do you record it? How do you facilitate communication with the client? And BDD says, we use examples for that, right? Rather than having abstract, non-deterministic, like, communication with the client where we're just, like, talking about abstract stuff, we talk in form of examples about the business rules. Rather than saying, okay, what business rules do you have on the feature? We're saying, okay, how this business rule will work in application to your, to your project? How will it apply to your product? How will email validation apply to this specific form, right? Will it show validation before send, press and submit? Will it show it afterwards? So basically you talk in form, in the language that everybody can understand. Non-technical people can understand comp examples. Technical people can understand examples. Everybody can talk in this language. And then a wonderful thing happens. If you have communication and you have examples, and if examples are structured, and record it before sprint, then you can say, let's commit to examples. We don't need to commit to the business rules if we have a communication. And if communication is written, you can commit to the communication. You can say, this thing we talked about right now, this is what we promised to deliver. And how this communication or examples could look like. So this is your classical user story or feature. And you could have like, Different business rules there, like successful registration when visitor provides all the required information, unable to register when visitor misses required information, and on and on and on. And then you go into examples. So given I'm on the home page when I follow sign up and I fill in registration form and I submit it, then I should be successfully registered and I should be on the home page again, right? Example clearly defines what, it, what you do. No tools involved. You do this before even going into sprint. This is just a classical structural way to define your communication. You just want to be consistent with the way you write down or talk about your features. And that's just a format that fits to this need. And look at this. In order to maintain my shopping history, the business value is always there. So when somebody will take this story, will take this feature, and will try to implement it, either it's your developer or tester, they already know why they're doing what they're doing. They already know why it is important. So you could have completely different level of communication with your testers or developers. This is something that happens with us a lot. Where testers start asking business questions. Why is it important? Why this feature is so drastically important for this project? And here comes another question. It's like how to avoid gold plating. So how to make sure that during delivery, we don't build complex architecture that will support all the possible changes that we will never need. Right? Because let's face it, we as a developers have tendency of overcomplicating things. Right? Even though if, if we're not being asked to deliver some part of functionality, we can presume that this part of functionality will be asked for in the future, and we can overcomplicate things. We can put changeability into the parts of the system that will never change. So in order to prevent this from happening, there is a this is particularly where BDD, actual classical BDD, kicks in. And we have practice called full stack BDD, consisting of like two tools. And this is classical BDD. So you have your user stories already written, which consist of the examples. So what you do then, you go through examples and you write new code and write new code until the example is, is done. And then you go back to the story. So basically like what this practice does, it keeps you on the line making sure that everything you're doing in the code actually fulfills something in the business. Rather, so 
you never, very quickly actually, you will find yourself in not thinking about how complex the system will be tomorrow because what you have now is a clear definition of how it should be tomorrow, right? So you're trying to identify the minimal amount of code you need to deliver and you have a tools to help you in that. Tools that, says, that, that tell you you need to deliver this particular part in this particular part of application. You need to deliver this code in this particular part of application. Outside layer called scenario BDD or story BDD and basically what it does, it takes this thing which you already described before without any tools and it says, hey, let's automate it, right? Let's just, just because how structural it is, let's make it a test. And this is where it comes behat. So there is different ways to describe behat. The simplest way I've found is everybody is familiar with PHP unit, at least at some extent. So behat is assert equals, right? So what it does, it takes your application, takes your feature in your feature file, and asserts that they are equal. That's it. And it's very, very easy to set up. You take your features that you already described in your example workshop before the sprint, you put them into a folder in the project, you install Behat via Composer or just download in Behat.far, and then you run bin Behat in it. It creates all the project structure for you. So what you will have, in addition to your features that you already had before, this class, basically this class describes how those features should be tested, right? You, you, Behat doesn't make assumptions what those words or sentences in the human language mean. You need to help him to understand what, what is given I'm on the homepage actually means. But don't worry, it's like the mapping actually happens through regular expressions or ternary patterns, so it's like complex stuff. Behat, instead of getting into the way, helps you by generating the stuff for you. So all those mappings, all those methods that map your specific step to specific code, Behat, when you run it, generates them for you as an output. So you never actually need to write any of those mappings, any regexps. You just copy paste them. And even more than that, you don't even need to copy paste them to your context class, to your code. You just run Behat with append snippets and it will actually append code to your class, right? So you just run this command and Behat automatically creates the mappings inside your code base. And then when you run it again, you have something like this. Given I'm on the home page, to do right pending definition. So it's like Behat asks you, please explain me what I should do there. How can I test that you're on the home page? So this is where you have like undefined state in your outside zone and the business zone. So the first goal is the classical goal of TDD, color it red. So we have this method inside the context class generated for us. I'm on the home page. What we do is we create some like HTTP crawler that just goes to the page and checks the response code, result code, right? And if it's not 200, so it's like page doesn't exist or page has a problem, you just throw an exception, any arbitrary PHP exception. Then when you run behind again, you have this clear exception there, cannot open home page, right? So this is where your test drives you towards some goal. So it's like, it tells you what to do. Please add the home page. So you have read and the, the rule of TDD is change the message as quickly as possible. So if you have like classical framework or uh, Symfony or Drupal or Zen, it doesn't matter. Uh, usually what happens is it throws exceptions along the way and exceptions, you can interpret them as telling you what exactly to do. So you have no homepage, so you can, for example, uh, add the configuration for the homepage which requires some root. You run behind again and frameworks throws root not found extent, exception. So you go and you add the root, you run behind again, template not found exception, okay? You go there, create a template, you run it again, bam, you're green, right? This is a development process. You never touched your code, but you already made one step green and you know that the homepage is there because you checked for that. You can read more about Behat on Behat.org. There is extensive documentation there that can guide you through. What I want to stop on is about inner loop. So at some point, like, you can go through those steps qu fairly quickly by just like adding templates, changing configuration of your CMS or the framework, and you will make green, green, so it's like add the fields, add the button, and then at some point you will hit something like this. Object user in this method register does not exist, right? Which means like there is code that is missing. So you need to add new code. 
And what happens there is just you go to the inner cycle, right? You need to describe the objects and their interactions. And the way you do this is classical TDD. You describe object, you implement object, and then you refactor. There is a tool for that called PHP spec. The way you do this is you install it via Composer, and then you just use it. That's simple. So for example, describe. How does it look? You do something like this. Bin PHP spec desk, which means describe, and you define the namespace or the class name for the object that you're trying to describe. And it looks like this. User extends object behavior. Function, it is registered by default. So we write this like method that explains what the object does and what properties it has. It is registered by default. And what we say there is like this, which references to the user object, should be registered. Right? When we run the hat, what, well, PHP spec, sorry, what happens is it actually finds out that the user object, there is a specification for the user, there is a test, but there is no user class. So Bihat tells us, class does not exist. Do you want me to create it for you? Right? It doesn't force you to create classes. It will create it for you in the proper folder, in the proper PSR, if you use PSR, namespace. So you hit Y and you press Enter, it creates class for you. And then you run it again and it says, oh, also in this class, the method that you're asking is registered, does not exist. Do you want me to create it for you? Why is registered? Because this should be registered actually means that PHP spec will look for the is registered method that returns true, and the method is not there. So PHP spec tells you, method is not there, do you want me to create it for you? Yes, create it for me. And then the only thing you actually need to write in form of code is go to this class, to this method, and replace like comment with return true. So this is how you describe thing. You made it green, and then you go to the design phase where you just like fine tune your objects and communications between them. This is where you do classical like design patterns and stuff. More on PHP spec here. And the cool part is just like going through these iterations. At some, pay, at some point you just like hit the green, right? Your scenario is implemented. What does it mean? It means one of the examples of your business rule that you committed to in the project or in the sprint is actually done. Right? So you have your feedback loop where you can actually go to the client, show it, or not showing it, just show the deployed part of application, and it's already there. You already covered this journey. Rather than just implementing an abstract part of functionality here and there for the website, you actually covered complete journey. Even if it's one part of it, it is already there. And the cool part is, we actually made then I should be successfully registered in step green. We didn't make and I should be on the home page against step green. The reason why we didn't make it green and it's still green is because we already defined or described to be had how he should test the act of being on homepage. So that's the thing that like newcomers miss on we had. It's just like you think that you need to provide those mapping to every single sentence that you have in your feature files. At some point you just hit the limit and it's like it's usually one, two sprints where you just discover that you already have the uh, dictionary or set of sentences that you use to describe any part of functionality on the website. You already have those sentences there. And what happens is, you have scenarios with seven steps there, and you need to write definition only for one of them. Everything else is auto already automated. So at this point, you don't need to automate every single step. It's just like one small fraction of it. And then you get to the green inside, you, you get to the green outside. So basically, like this is a two jars that drive together on. And the cool part about it is this all sounds crazy and uh, kind of amazing shift. We went through this amazing shift at Envika. Uh, and we do a lot of projects. We do Drupal projects. We do Magento projects, Symfony projects, ev everything PHP. We just focus on the enterprise. And I personally went through mo more than six projects in the last half of year. And almost on all of them, we use this approach. And the outcomes are immense, right? Because basically what happens is if you help client to see the value in the project he's trying to deliver, or if you help users or customers to see the value in what you're doing, they stop caring about the scope and the budget. Because when client cares about the scope and the budget, is not, it is nothing else as an act of caring about how much he will lose. And if you give him incentive or way to care about how much you will gain 
he stops caring about how much he will lose. And we also teach others to do that. So we have training courses, we have coaching courses. We come to the companies and train others to do this stuff on the project basis. So I think that's it for me today. Questions? I, ha I think we have time. Yeah. Any questions? Yes? You have that kind of um, immediately kind of cycle where you were defining what your expected behavior to be and then you kind of go down to the specification. Mm -hmm. uh, there's kind of around how you expect the code to behave. How would that work if you were doing something in Drupal where maybe the feature is being implemented by installing the module and adding some configuration? And it doesn't really map up this idea that we have this class and we can end up on this class that does this. As, as, as I said, there is like Writing specification and writing code is not the goal. The goal is to, to change the state. Like, this is a classical TDD. The goal is to change the message of the failure as quick as possible. And if you can change the message of the failure just by installing some module or pre-configuring some module or just changing a template without writing the code, you don't need to go to the specs level. Yeah. Um, no, we didn't use it for Drupal yet, okay. but we used it for, for Magento, which you could imagine. Yeah. There are challenges there, but um, it is possible. Uh, there is like, there is a prerequisite of a PHP spec where it kind of, there is a thing about this tool, it pushes you to, to clear design. So it basically like it does two things. It helps you to, to drive out the good design out of your code, so like ensure the high inner quality, but it also punishes you for the bad design. So basically like if you're working with legacy system which has a lot of bad decisions in it, it could be the case where like PHP spec will punish you more than give you benefits because the tool was deliberately designed this way. Yeah. So that's the thing. But like our guys found a way to do this with Magento. So there's nothing impossible. Yep. Can you um, illustrate uh, a workflow with your team how you interact with clients? So uh, creating the backlog, um, your testers, who is writing is the hack code? Is it the testers? Is it the. Uh, you mean the automated tests themselves? Yeah. Yep. So basically, like the the rules are really really simple. Uh, we usually like it's testers or developers that actually automate scenarios. Scenario, scenarios are written as an outcome of the conversation or example conversation with the client. We usually don't write Gherkin immediately at the meeting, by the same reasons why, for example, when you have a meeting with editorial on the project, you never write like perfectly formatted doc document, right? You, you don't spend time like on, on setting the headers and stuff. So Gherkin is just like, is a structured way to define your examples. You don't want to spend time on like structuring your conversation too much because you will get carried away from the actual conversation with the client. So what we usually do, we have all of the, we have entire team because it's agile. We have entire team almost from the beginning of the project to, till the last moment of the project involved in the conversations with the client because they all have input. We talk with the client in form of examples. We then go away and write those examples for the client, but we share it with him and we get it for approval. And also, which is a usual st fact, clients look through those scenarios, they understand them, and they either ask us for corrections or they make corrections themselves, right? So it is living documentation where usually we, like, they don't write it themselves because we don't want to lose their time on like bringing structure to some to the conversation we, it is more important to have conversation initial conversation with them but they can maintain those scenarios later on and that's more important so when you do your script presentation you present against yeah yeah 
So as I said, we use those as acceptance criteria for the, for the sprint. Yep. Yes. Yeah, so you're saying that um, when, when you introduced it, you're saying that this, this process works really well in the majority of cases, mm -hmm. but there, there were some, you know, in typical cases. Uh, yep. Uh, and I'm thinking particularly from the business point of view, you know, the business process of the impact mapping. What, what kind of cases would you say that you found where you, you wouldn't want to apply them? It's, it's very, very simple. It's like, it is a rare situation, but we kind of get into the situation from time to time, sadly enough. Uh, this process, is so fine-tuned and built around the idea of value that if you suddenly get into the situation with like, you know, like some big corporate clients like tend to, to have this. If your client doesn't care about the value, like at all, like you're telling him like, do you care about the revenue? And he's like, no, I don't care. Like maybe my boss cares, but I'm not talking with him too much. In this particular case, it, it tends to be really hard because you don't have leverage you don't have opportunity to talk with people, you know, just like, if they don't, like, you can't make somebody care about something if he doesn't. So what we usually do with BDD, with BDD pipeline, we just like, we uncover that somebody cares, and like, 90% of the clients, they care, right? If you talk about the revenue, especially like e-commerce, you know, like the small startups, they care, it's just like, they, they never thought about it, it's just like, they think about the scope, but they, they don't know that they can actually like achieve value on revenues. It's just like when you're starting to talk with them about the revenues, like, oh my God, I can, I can gain money off this. But if they don't, what can you do? Uh, it is hard. In this particular case, we just like, that's what I said, it's just like, set of practices, they make sense. We use them as a co coherent practice from the start to the, bo to, to the end. But sometimes it's just like, because of specific client, because of specific project, we mix and match, throw some practices off, throw some other practices in, just trying to fine tune to specific client. That's the part partial reason why, you know, like agile trainings are so popular and will, will ever be because like you always have those differences, different teams, different projects, different clients. And it's just like, you need to fine tune. You need to have experience to do that. So I hope it answers the question. Cool. Yeah. They do evolve. So like the classical thing, as I said, you write those without having any tool involved. So what usually happens is just like you use different sentences like or different words to describe the thing that, is already, that was already described with, with, with another sentence. So during development, developers find it and just like, just use it, re rephrase it a bit to just reuse the, the definitions that they used before. They communicate it back to the client. If the change is drastic, if for example, developers find out that like, the behavior that they're testing actually doesn't make sense and it should change a lot, this is where you need to communicate with the client back and he says like, this scenario we talked about, this example, it is complex because of that, that, and that. I propose this one instead. Are you okay with that? So just like, it's a feedback loop. It, 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 like, it is a commitment, but you have opportunity to change it. We, we change it inside the sprint, we don't recommit to it, so we can throw features away from the sprint but we never put something additional in. So your testers test uh, this like, locally on their machines in an automated fashion, like both get commits and Just because it's automated, we usually use, um, I think the, the, the best answer is like, yeah, we use CIs and developers also test their work on their machines. We use testers with their experience for much better parts of the, of the development processes where they, rather than just clicking through the website, we actually use their experiences where it fits better. So it's just like they, found, they find out during the meetings like how to break application, all those edge cases that we didn't thought about as a delivery team. And also they will, they like user tested afterwards that it feels okay. So something that machine can't automate, this is what, where testers expertise lies and this is what they're doing. So you're shifting their work bit in this regard. Okay. So there is, there is one last bit that I, I kind of wanted to touch. I think it is important to notice that it's just like all of those things I learned from, the, from both developing tools and talking with community and we have amazing behind community out there that just like constantly does things and like shares the knowledge and tries to bring more blood into the community. And uh, I, I know that there is like meetup upcoming or uh, training 
Yeah. Yeah. So it's just like getting started, uh, and you can talk with with this man to to get in very soon. So cool. Thank you very much. <laughs>